for the chair of the meeting open. Um, the, mem the committee meeting will be recorded online uh, and broadcast throughout Parliament uh, buildings and the online. I want to advise over to members come in. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the, the public gallery and advise uh, you that uh, you're very welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're on airplane mode and all devices are muted and you can connect to the family Wi-Fi. Details of the password are available on the gallery rules which can be found on the seats, on your seats of the public gallery. And it's not permitted to take photographs or record anything uh, at the meeting. Um, first item here is apologies. We have one apology in from John Blair. Um, have members were have any other apologies? No. no. Uh, draft member minutes. I want to refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of January. It's on page 7 to 13. Um, and could I get your agreement uh, for the minutes? Okay, great. Okay, um, we have. Okay, we uh, next item in the agenda is I want you. We have a, a departmental written briefing on SRs relating to food and farming, and that's on page fifteen uh, to twenty eight on your packs. Um, I want to inform members that we will be considering the statutory rules in groups and the relevant officials are present today to answer any queries members may have. Once members have been briefed on all of the SRs relating to that group, then the question will be put. Um, so, uh, so issues relating to the SRs from Food and Farming Group paper from the clerk, which is at pages 5 to 8 of the table papers. Okay. The Five to table papers. So the first statutory rules for consideration are um, the SR um, uh, areas national constraint, the SR twenty eighteen one two two, the SR twenty eight one nine one, SR twenty eighteen twenty one six, SR twenty nineteen eleven, SR twenty nineteen sixteen. 20, SR 201966, SR 201967, SR 201985, and SR 2019-210. And at this point, I'd like to welcome Norman Fulton, Deputy Secretary and the Head of Group of Food and Farming, Stephen Johnson, Grade 7, Agri-Food Policy, John Tarrington, Grade 7, Agri-Food Brexit Policy, and Nicola uh, Connery, Grade 7, Agri-Food Policy. And uh, I'd like to welcome you yes, to the the, uh, the the committee again. Um, I'd like to uh, first of all ask Norman perhaps to give um, an overview. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so, in total, uh, there have been uh, ten statutory rules uh, made by Food and Farming Group uh, using the negative uh, resolution procedure. Uh, so, I'm accompanied here uh, this morning by Nicola Connery, uh, Stephen Johnson, John Terrington, uh, who have been responsible for. Uh, most of the uh, legislation we'll discuss this morning. So we'll start by just providing a very short introduction to the functions of Food and Farming Group uh, to set a little context <coughs> for the statutory rules that you, you'll be considering. So the group develops uh, departmental policy in relation to uh, food and farming, including the implementation of programmes to support the sustainable development of the agri-food sector. That implementation is through inspection, uh, payments, enforcement, licensing, certification, advice uh, and guidance relating to agriculture, horticulture, food and uh, countryside management. The uh, group is also the managing authority for the Rural Development Programme uh, and delivers uh, a range of uh, RDP schemes uh, aimed uh, at supporting sustainable development within agri-food. Um, it also, through uh, CAFRI, uh, delivers the department's policy on skills and competence development uh, for those who are wishing to enter the industry or, or already working in it. Um, and it finally, it delivers their science uh, uh, transformation program, managing the uh, science agenda, 
with the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute uh, and commissioning the department's research uh, programme. So turning back to the statutory uh, rules, uh, as I said to start, there are 10 uh, covering uh, a range of areas uh, and we could uh, group them. Uh, first of all, there are a group of three regulations uh, that the uh, department uh, identified as being necessary uh, to update out-of-date EU references uh, within our existing statutory rules uh, before, uh, and had to do that before the power to do so uh, was revoked by the EU Withdrawal Act. Secondly, there's a group of four SRs uh, where legislation was required to implement uh, or enforce changes to EU legislation, uh, including new requirements uh, that came into uh, force uh, during the period whilst the UK was negotiating its departure from the EU, uh, so effectively keeping pace. Uh, so uh, just turning to the detail of those, so the three uh, updating uh, SRs were the Agriculture Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations, uh, secondly the Residues, Charges and, ex and Examination Amendment Regulations, thirdly, and that one was made uh, jointly with the Department of Health, Thirdly, then, uh, the eggs, uh, chicks and poultry meat amendments regulation. Um, and each uh, of the, uh, each amendment to domestic legislation said was uh, made in order to update out-of-date references. Uh, such minor technical changes would normally be made uh, whenever more substantive changes uh, would be brought forward for these pieces of legislation. However, because the powers to make such changes, changes were being uh, repealed uh, on the day uh, that the UK uh, left the EU, it was necessary to, to bring forward those changes uh, uh, before uh, planned exit days, which initially was 29th of March, then 31st uh, of October. So we needed to make those changes um, in advance of that before the revocation of the, uh, um, the power to do so. The second category then is new uh, EU regulations, enforcement regulations. There are four in that uh, category covering beef and veal labelling, uh, carcass classification, marketing of bananas and equine identification. Again, required to make or update the domestic legislation in, in order to implement, uh, implement or enforce changes that have been made to EU legislation. So really maintaining our obligation to implement EU uh, legislation in a timely manner. Um, then we have uh, another, I suppose, three uh, remaining ones. Uh, first, uh, it's a common agricultural policy, basic payment and support schemes revocation regulations, uh, a bit of a mouthful. Uh, but really, it's about introducing simplification to the direct payments uh, regime uh, that became an option for us uh, from the 2018 scheme year. Uh, and to be effective for that year, uh, the Commission had to be notified of our change uh, from uh, by the 31st of March 2018, and that decision had to be then reflected uh, by removing a, a redundant provision uh, within our regulations, leaving them technically correct. Uh, so within this particular piece of simplification, each year there's an administrative requirement uh, or effort uh, employed in identifying a very small number of businesses uh, that fall within the so-called negative list provisions. Uh, it has no material impact. Uh, it's just a lot of administration for ourselves and businesses involved, and therefore the option was uh, taken to actually uh, remove uh, the requirement to administer the negative list. So it was a simplification uh, of our administration. The second one uh, within this uh, sort of actual category then is uh, the Common Agriculture Policy Review of Decisions Regulations. Uh, so Review of Decisions uh, makes a charge, uh, a fee, paid to those who wish to have their case uh, considered by an independent panel. Uh, we reviewed and revised our approaches, uh, approach to uh, uh, the uh, panel process uh, and the increased fee was stipulated in a High Court order uh, that set aside uh, a judicial review uh, by the, the Ulster Farmers Union. Uh, that reflected an agreement that had been reached between the Department uh, and uh, the EFU on this particular issue. The SR uh, was required in 2019 to give a legal basis to allow the Department to increase the fee to appellants seeking assessment by a panel. Um, and the final one then uh, in this catch-all category is the areas of actual constraint regulation 2018. Uh, so this scheme was originally programmed for the uh, first two years of the current rural development programme um, and uh, with a budget of approximately £20 million per annum. Uh, 
uh, there was a review carried out in 2016 um, after that initial two-year period, and the Dairy Minister decided to extend the scheme for one whole year uh, with a budget um, of about eight million. This is on a transitional basis, uh, really the last year of the ANC scheme, uh, and the SR was made in January 2018 to give a legal basis to actually uh, operate the scheme. So we're on a, an annual cycle uh, of making those regulations anyway. Uh, so this is the, the final uh, annual um, regulation to uh, operate the ANC scheme. Um, so, that, uh, so the department has provided the committee with copies of the SL1 for each of those uh, SRs um, and um, oh, uh, the SR. Uh, so the SL1 makes it reasonably clear as to why the, the legislation was required. But happy to take any questions uh, the committee now have. Do members want to take a, a moment just to look through the SRs uh, before we um, open up for questions? Can you take a moment to look through those SRs? Um, okay, members, we have a number of members who have indicated they want to, to ask a question. I thought there was one. Um, just, just one I uh, want to kick off with um, myself. In relation to the um, ANC, uh, Norman, and I will make the point that it is um, profoundly regrettable that the ANC scheme no longer exists, You know, particularly when we have the likes of the South of Ireland, which has increasing support to the the farm, farmers in marginal areas, we have discontinued ours. Uh, the eight million budget that was allocated in 2018, um, first of all, w where did the ANC come from in the first place? And was that, uh, was that uh, eight million spent? So a ANC is actually part of our rural development uh, programme, so it's embedded within the programme. Mm -hmm. um, and the, uh, the monies that were spent uh, in that year, uh, the total expenditure was but just over 8.88 million, mm. um, and that was a combination of uh, EU and national funding, 60-40 uh, uh, to national, uh, and so that was the, the final year in, in the mm. transition uh, out uh, of that particular scheme. So it was pillar, pillar two funded scheme pillar combined with yeah. national monies. That's right. Thanks, uh, Norman. Okay, Harry, you the first to have indicated. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Norman, for attending today. Good to see you again. It's um, 2019067, the one on the Aquine Identification Regulation, Norman, just a wee question. Um, I wonder if you could tell me what other measures have been introduced to prevent unregulated horse meat entering the human food chain again? Yep. Um, the issue of um, horse meat is, you know, it's a big issue and yes. it's a complex issue. Yes. Um, the, the equine identification regulations that have just been introduced, um, many uh, of the requirements in the EU regulation which that um, enforces now, they're, they're the same or similar to the previous EU regulation, but some of the key requirements are specifically designed to improve, for example, um, the security aspects around um, the horse passport regime. Um, so, I mean, it is, an, it is a measure, but it's only one measure that is, um, you know, it, it improves traceability of animals. 
it's a it's a public health regulation as well. So there's it's a multi um, a multi purpose document, I suppose. Um, I mean, the issue of the horse meat um, scandal that you probably remember from the press a number of years ago is is something that is you know, you know beyond the scope of just this piece of legislation itself. But this piece of legislation certainly is intended to enhance the traceability of animals and also to record when um, horses are not destined for the human food chain on the basis of certain prescribed veterinary medic medicines that they've been that they've been given in their lifetime. Okay, thank you. John? Uh, Mr Chairman, no, I'm not going to go bananas, but I certainly <laughs> want to ask about them. Uh, the, the regulation is 2019 bar 066, and we're told that up until now uh, there was no necessary checks done because they came through uh, existing uh, uh, venues, if you like. Uh, I, I mentioned bananas because that's the one that very often is highlighted as uh, an opportunity to encourage uh, fair trade. Yes. And, and uh, I just wonder if it's necessary that Northern Ireland has that freedom and capacity to encourage fair trade through the importation of bananas uh, from parts of the world, of course, where they are reliable, wholesome, and uh, I have n no data in front of me to suggest how many bananas we consume in the year, but I suspect it's an awful lot, and uh, there may we be a, a wide variation in, 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 in where they come from and uh, how they're harvested, uh, but certainly as a new assembly, I would want to see the opportunity for Northern Ireland to actually uh, promote fair trade through uh, the marketing of this particular uh, product, which is one of our five, of course, per day. Uh, so I'm interested, well, I think probably I know the answer that up until now there was no need for regulation, but now there is, and is this something that you'd want to give thought to uh, so that the rest of us can, in fact, not be hamstrung in, 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 in how we promote products from the developing countries in particular? Yeah. I think at this point in time uh, there are no importers, uh, banana importers located within Northern Ireland and this piece of legislation is really to, in, in advance of our leaving the EU, uh, to close that gap, uh, yes. should there ever be yes. uh, an establishment. I hope there is. Uh, such, a, such a business uh, within Northern Ireland and then this would provide the basis then for the the regulation of, of, of marketing uh, standards uh, for bananas. So it's really, a, uh, I suppose, a, a precautionary uh, type piece of legislation to make sure that uh, we don't have that gap uh, within our coverage uh, and shooter uh, um, at some point. Through coverage. the chair, are you satisfied that, you know, that enough has been done to ensure that in the future, when hopefully we have the freedom to uh, exert greater influence over fair trade, that this regulation is sufficient to deal with that? Um, yes, this is dealing with the, the regulation of uh, standards. Uh, the yes. issue of uh, trade uh, is a reserved matter, um, and that's where uh, I suppose we uh, will look to, to London in terms of setting the, uh, the terms for the trading relationship uh, with partners, uh, including uh, from the ACP countries um, and, and those uh, development countries uh, who may be uh, supplying such product. And just finally, Chairperson, the importation of bananas at the moment, uh, are they coming largely from Britain or do we have any importation from the Republic of Ireland? Um, John, my understanding is that both, but mostly from Britain. And what will the impact of the importation of bananas <coughs> in the Republic of Ireland have? Um, in the, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, yeah. um, it's early stages of us looking at what the implications of the Northern Ireland programme uh, is, but certainly the uh, as part of fruit and veg um, is included in in, in, in the protocol, uh, and therefore, um, uh, in theory, we would be required to um, carry out the the, the checks uh, yeah. before they come in. But again, that's I say early early stages of that analysis. And just finally, finally, is bananas the only product that's caught up in this, or are there others as well? Well, I'll be enough. There, there, there is a, a separate piece, which was well, sorry, it's not the, the protocol, or in terms of there, there is a separate piece of uh, 
uh, marketing of fresh fresh produce um, separate to this, um, uh, which is made in Europe at the same time, same thing about the, stand, the standards of, 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 of fresh fruit. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Um, Rosemary? Thank you. Um, my question's in relation to SR 219.085. And it's just to clarify whether the regulation needs to be amended each time the Department appoints a person under the CAP regulations to make recommendations on how matters should be determined and the likely frequency that this would ha this the amendments may be required. So this is for the appointment of people to the panel? Yes. And that, that doesn't require uh, an amendment of the, the legislation? Doesn't require. No. no thank you. Okay, with me. Yep. Philip? Uh, mine's just a question on 2008-216. Uh, and there's a reference to uh, derogation of beef, so I'm just looking confirmation. Will that derogation apply in the north? Yeah, the, there were derogations in the 2010 regulations, and they were carried forward for both beef and pigs. Okay, fair enough. Okay, Philip. Um, Morris? Uh, thank you very much, John. Again, it's in uh, 218 to 216, uh, and it's the EU regulation regarding the scale, sales, uh, scales of classification of beef and sheep carcasses, etc. And there's a reference here that the department will need uh, legislative powers to enter premises and to implement any controls. Are you satisfied that this statutory rule adequately covers and grants the necessary powers? Yes. You're happy? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chair? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you very much for the for the briefs on, on the DSL, uh, the SRs as well. It's really really helpful. Um, obviously, a lot of this is EU updates and sort of technical in detail. Are you c c confident that this has been operational without any major impacts or feedback, negative feedbacks? Yeah. Yep. Can I maybe just then go back to sorry bananas? <laughs> 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 um, yours. In the brief, it said that no consultation was carried out for these changes, just due to the urgency uh, um, that you had to get up for the, through for the Brexit date. But the Brexit date you were using was the 29th of March. Yeah. So given that that was a movable date, and then movable again, has any consultation been carried out since, given that the urgency wasn't quite as urgent in the end? Uh, no. 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 It, it is worth saying we did shortly after that consult on amendments to these regulations uh, through the EU, EU Withdrawal Act to make uh, these regulations operable um, for the period of time when we did leave. Mm. We consulted no, so, so anybody that would have been involved would have been aware yes. that these had been made at that point. Um, uh, and there were no there were no, there were no comments on, on, on that. Great, thank you. Um, and just want to come back one follow up as well, if that's okay, just on the equine identification, the SR 2019067. Um, you say that in the consultation responses that there were mixed views in terms of the use of civil sanctions um, alongside or without the criminal sanctions as well. I just wonder if you could give us a wee bit of further details on those uh, and what those sanctions are, but also have they been used much here? So the civil sanctions, uh, that was one of the derogations in the EU rules that we did not adopt. Um, so there were there were a number of additional measures in the EU regulation which we didn't adopt. So one was civil sanctions and one was in fact the retrospective microchipping of older yeah. horses born before 2009. Um, we, we took the view at the time that that would constitute a, a major policy change and therefore we did not. We essentially, in bringing in this regulation, we took as the essential aspects of the EU regulation into the domestic legislation. Um, and so we, we haven't adopted those civil sanctions, therefore they haven't been used. Mm. Um, it, that would be for, for a minister to decide upon, I suppose. We haven't gone to the minister yet on that aspect. Right. And just in terms of um, uh, you know how it's done in the rest of GB and ROI, those civil sanctions weren't adopted in the South either, but they, they are being sequentially adopted in GB on different okay. dates um, throughout 2020 and 2021. Thank you. And have we ever used criminal sanctions here in Northern Ireland under that? I'm not aware. I would have to check and come back, but I'm not aware of criminal sanctions having been used under this, on, under the, the previous domestic legislation. But I would I would check that and come back to you. Don't bother. Thank you very much. Okay. Philip, you're looking back in again there. Uh, please. Uh, just in relation to uh, 201911, 
uh, just kind of the last bit it's saying uh, these changes are not relevant to ROI uh, as they relate to the UK's exit from the EU. Just, I mean, why is that the case? It's not relevant. I, I, I guess that's not in, in terms of this piece of legislation being made at the time. It wasn't relevant. I think that was probably the point that, that would have been made in the SL1. Uh, those references and, and ability references and so on that would have been added um, uh, would, 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 would be keeping parity with, with other EU or, or they would be making them at a time when appropriate to do so while updating the, the various pieces of legislation. As I say, these are... Uh, technical references to EU legislation and would from time to time be, be updated when making more um, substantive changes that there are some included in the carcass legislation for example that was being done at that time so, so it was done separately so I guess the, the point is that, that, that they're not relevant at that point in time and in, in that the ROI may already have done so or will be doing so whenever they make substantive, substantive changes. The changes but, but will... Yes, this is, this is, it's about parity and keeping, keep, keep, keeping pace with, with, with EU legislation. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, I'd like the opportunity then to thank the officials uh, for your attendance. Um, I'm going to put the question in relation to these um, SRs. Um, okay. Uh, that the members that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Affairs has considered SR 2018-18, the areas of natural constraint, NA 2018, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, the court has no objection to the rule. Great. Yeah. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Affairs has considered SR 2018-122, the Common Agriculture Policy Basic Payment and Support <coughs> Schemes Revocation Regulations, NA 2018, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, the court has no objection to the rule. The 2018-191, uh, uh, the, the, the Committee of uh, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, 2018-191, the Beef and Veal, uh, Veal Labelling Amendment Regulations 2018, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. The, uh, that the Committee of Agriculture, Environment and Affairs has considered 2018-216, the Carcass Classification and Price Reporting Regulations 2018, and subject to examiner of such rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. Um, the, that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019-11, the Agriculture and Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations 2019, and subject to examiner statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019-16, the Residues, Charges and Examination Amendment Regulations NI 2019, and subject to examiner statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. That the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019-66, the Marketing of Bananas Regulations NI 2019, and subject to examiner statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. That the Committee of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, CERT, uh, SR 2019-67, the Equine and Identification Regulations, NA 2019, and subject to examiner statute rules, there's no objection to the rule. Agreed. The Committee of uh, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019-85, the Common Agriculture and Policy Review of Decisions Amendment Regulations, NA 2019, and subject to examiner of statute rules, there's no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. The Committee uh, of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019 Common Agriculture and Policy re Review of Decisions Amendment Regulations NA 2019 and subject to examiner statutory rules, there's no objection to the rule. Okay. Hey, members, the next group of SR for consideration are from the Veterinary Service and Animal Health Group, and there are five um, SRs for consideration. Um, they're in your pack SR 2019, SR, uh, SR 201982, uh, which is 162 to 84 in your pack. SR 2019-197, which is 1585 to 192 in your pack. SR 2018 uh, to 204 is 193 to 201 in your pack. SR 2018-213 is pages 202 to 244. And SR 2019-227 is pages 245 to 272 in your packs. And I want to refer you to the briefing at one, pages 153 to 161 in your packs and any issues relating to the SR from this group can be found at eight, pages 8 to 9 in your uh, table papers. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, the officials, Robert Huey, uh, uh, the Chief Veterinary Officer, Grade 3, 
Naomi Calhoun, Grade 6 EU Translation and Legislation Branch. Naomi. Uh, Chris Andrews, Grade 7 Animal Identification Welfare Branch. Anne um, Lochran, uh, Grade 7 Animal Health Strategy and TSE. And there were two others on the list. Uh, John, Ignatius and Jonathan. They're there. They're also there. Ignatius and Jonathan. Ignatius McKeown, Grade 7 Epizootic Disease, TSE and Animal Byproducts. And Jonathan, the yeah, I Division of Veterinary Officer. Um, I'd like to, Robert, you're very welcome, and you're all very welcome, and I'd like, maybe could ask you, Robert, to provide an overview of the SRs. Good morning, Chair, um, members of the committee, and it's a really great pleasure to be here when you meet that. Um, we're bringing five, as you say, statutory rules before you today, and before I start, I'd, I'd like to reassure the committee that we have been fastidious in ensuring that we weren't exceeding powers in putting anything into these uh, statutory rules. Hence, they're quite boring, <laughs> but that's why um, we did our best. Um, three of the rules deal with official controls. Sorry, I should say that a bit about what my group do. Um, Veterinary Service Animal Health Group, which I lead, is responsible for official controls. It's responsible for animal health, animal welfare, and some aspects of public health, particularly the diseases that people can get from animals, the zoonotic diseases. Uh, we also implement uh, for animal health and animal welfare uh, for livestock, uh, where PS and I look at after other aspects of implementation of welfare, uh, particularly for fighting dogs and that sort of thing. And the local authorities look after uh, pets and after uh, some aspects of horse welfare. So a very broad branch of things. So we look at animal health, we look after the diseases that we do have, we don't want, primarily TB uh, is the one that will immediately come to your mind. We, we try to keep out diseases we don't want, like foot and mouth disease, African swine fever, and in, in, in influenza, and we deal with them if they are come in, and we have portal controls in order to try and keep out those diseases. Uh, and we also carry out meat hygiene inspection in the abattoirs uh, for uh, the FSA, and we look after feed controls. So I'm responsible for the entire safety of animal, animal health, from feed through to slaughter, and um, for, for animal welfare, for most aspects of animal welfare, and I look forward to coming back to you to talk to you about all those things in, in more detail. I suspect it won't be long before the chair calls me back to talk about TB. Yeah. I just have this <laughs> premonition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, three of the rules, the five rules we're for you to deal with, are these, this thing called official controls, which is really about inspection, audit and verification of, of standards. TSE and zoo technical standards uh, were required uh, to comply with obligations under EU law. These statutory rules are needed to ensure that the relevant EU laws could operate effectively in Northern Ireland and to make sure that we avoided the threat of infraction proceedings by the European Commission and the associated financial penalties, a threat which remains despite our impending exit from the EU. These instruments de designated the Department as a competent authority to carry out certain actions under the relevant EU laws and to allow us to enforce EU requirements. Had we not made this legislation, we would have been lagging behind the other jurisdictions of the UK that made similar instruments to implement the relevant EU laws. More importantly, however, we would have had no legal basis to carry out our enforcement action in these areas. Very simple things like access to farm. We wouldn't have been allowed onto premises. Uh, these, these laws give us those sorts of uh, authority. This would have an inverse impact on public health and our ability to export. There was therefore a clear public interest in making this legislation, and as such, it was entirely in line with Northern Ireland Executive Formation Act and Secretary of State guidance that set out what departments could do in the absence of ministers. The other two instruments before you, the two animal health and welfare amended regulations, were there to update outdated references to EU laws in our domestic animal health and welfare legislation. And those two in particular, all that happened there was changing of the titles of legislation that were embedded in the legislation. That's all that happened in those two regulations, purely technical updates. It was necessary for us to make these uh, instruments to bring our, our law up to date in advance of EU exit, and because there was uncertainty as to whether we would have the powers to do this if we left the EU without an agreement. At that time, provision had been made in the EU Withdrawal Act of 2019 to repeal the European <coughs> Communities Act 1972, which contained the power to implement EU law using secondary and subordinate le legislation. 
This matter is now resolved for the duration of the transition period. The EU withdrawal agreement bill retains that power. And we could not have been but we could not have preempted it at the time that we need the legislation. The instruments were made to ensure that we had a functioning statute book on EU exit and as such were made in the public interest. They formed part of a raft of legislative instruments taken, taken forward across the department and the rest of the UK for the same purpose, to update the statute book in advance of EU exit. And the official controlled ones in particular uh, also co covers plant health and uh, John Joe will present that afterwards in the, in the, in the next uh, group of legislation. I hope that's very brief introduction provides the committee with a high level overview as to what we were required to make these instruments in the absence of the Assembly. And uh, that is all really I want to say by way of introduction, Chair. Thank you, Robert. Um, um, I will maybe give members a moment to take a look through uh, the, the SRs that uh, Robert has very kindly provided the overview for before we move on to questions. Okay, uh, we have a number of people who have indicated that they wish to ask some questions and should also just uh, request as well that when you're asking a question just to specify which SR that you're actually referring to. Uh, first person who's indicated that they wish to ask a question is John Tallett. Chairperson, uh, SR 2019-227, Animal Health. Is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, can you tell us if there has been any significant change to the powers of entry and penalties from the 2007 regulations, which these regulations replace? There has been no um, significant change. The powers um, basically mirror those that um, are provided um, in the 2007 regulations. Well, has there been any significant or subsequent feedback to the Department outside the formal consultation process in relation to the controlled? There has been there has been no um, no formal um, feedback. Um, there was no public consultation carried out in relation to those um, regulations. Um, the the department has, however, made stakeholders aware of um, there, there there are some minor operational changes um, implemented by the overarching EU regulation, and stakeholders have been advised of those. Um, but no, there has been no um, comments from stakeholders on the regulations. Do you want us to explain? We have a, a formal stakeholder forum, a yeah. health and welfare stakeholder forum, that represents a broad breadth of uh, industry interests. Um, and uh, this legislation and the legislative changes uh, associated with EU exit have been taken through it to explain to them uh, what changes uh, might occur. Uh, Mr Chairman, that surprises me. Uh, you will understand that particularly in the future, our uh, standards of uh, animal health will be a top priority mm. in terms of competing with cheap imports, which unfortunately I dread will come from other parts of the world where standards are, are not high. And without passing any judgment on a recent case in Clock Mills, uh, because I don't know the details, it, it uh, seems to me that animal welfare uh, should be a top priority in terms of seeking to uh, protect uh, the practices. I say that in the full understanding that the vast majority of farmers exercise the highest standards of animal welfare, but unfortunately you will always find a rotten apple in the barn, and that continues to be the case. And, uh, you know, while I certainly agree with this SR today. I do believe there is an urgent need uh, to pursue uh, and to ensure that our animals are given the highest protection possible and that the department has the uh, easiest possible access to where these animals are found. As you're aware, uh, under the Northern Ireland Protocol, as it stands, we in Northern Ireland will be maintaining the full EU a key 
So we will be we will have to maintain um, the full legislative uh, powers of the EU in order that Northern Ireland can can trade freely with the rest of Europe, primarily the Republic of Ireland, is our interest, uh, and that, that that is part. The the UK BEFRA have made it clear that animal welfare is in negotiation one of their priorities. So I'm reassured by, by that. Um, and on the matter recently, Chair, I, I'd be very happy for my officials to brief committee either as a committee or individually on recent animal welfare issues if they would so wish. The Chairperson, the reassurances I got there are very encouraging. And I simply would say to the Department, this is a top priority, even though you may not have had a lot of consultation on it, because bad apples don't normally consult on their bad behaviour. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And Robert, we may take you up on that offer for, sure. for the brief. That would be okay. good. Um, OK, thank you. I think, John. Uh, Rosemary, uh, you're next. Yeah, thank you. Um, relation to SR 218 um, Just to ask you what the, the overall annual cost of BSE testing to the department is at the moment, or to the taxpayer? Ignatius, yes. Uh, the, the current cost of uh, the, the cost which we supply to the, the rendering of the oh, is basically in the region of 150,000 um, oh, pounds per year. Just when he finishes speaking. That is what we pay the staff to do the PSE sample. Stop being yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, could, could I just say, um, uh, see in terms of any future merge, we'll need you to come forward to the, to the, the table, mics. Ignatius, yeah. to the, the mics here. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just come forward, because you may, yeah, may yeah. want to follow up on the supplementary. Yeah. And just turn, turn the mic in your direction there, so we can get you on the record. Apologies, Chair. Just turn the mic in your asset. Yeah. Okay. Perfect, Thanks. thank you. On the issue of charging, there, there is an issue that um, we did consult on this particular uh, yeah. uh, piece of legislation, and uh, one of the proposals that was all, was in there initially was to transfer a charge of 650 from the department um, to the industry, which would inevitably have ended up with the farmer. So um, there's, a, there's six pounds fifty at the moment, which the department picks up uh, a cost for every animal that's sampled. And there was a proposal in the uh, original <coughs> consultation uh, to transfer that to the industry. Um, that was, as you might expect, there was objections to that, and we dropped yep. that. So that's an example of where we, we thought we might put something in, and then we, once it became controversial, we just took it out again. Um, so you listen to the cons yes. listen well, to course, the consultation. That's what that's what it's for. <laughs> okay, thank you. And one just um, one other. One other issue, um, SR 218-204, in relation to the breed, breed societies. Um, just have, have there been any new breed societies officially recognised since November 2018? Uh, if I may, Chair. Um, the last breed society the Department recognised was back in 2004, and that was the European Angus. Uh, there have been no new breed societies have come forward for recognition in Northern Ireland uh, since, uh, since 2004. Okay, thank you. Rosemary. I think, Rosemary, we have three altogether. We have the Irish Moyles, yeah. Angus and uh, Suffolk Sheep, are the other one. And then two, there's two equine uh, societies, Breeders Elite and Northern Ireland Horse Board. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, well, uh, sorry, Morris. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Just a follow on from, from Rosemary's question there. Uh, the cost of this is potentially going to be borne, but borne in the future by the farmer. Have you done any impact assessment on what that effect will have on the farmer? And the other thing, is, well, go ahead, I'll, I'll ask it. You're referring there to the TSE sampling Aye, and the yeah. charges. Well, we didn't proceed with that proposal, yeah. so there were there would be no um, no costs arising. Um, were, were we to proceed with it in the future, it would be a ministerial decision, and at that stage, we would obviously carry out a, a cost analysis. Then I'll come back here. Okay. The other one was the uh, BSE testing. Uh, it's very, very low at the minute uh, because there's a, a reduced risk. But 
Has the department prepared if there were ever were another serious outbreak to deal with it quickly? Oh, yeah, yes, and <coughs> find some wood. Um, as you know, we currently have an eligible risk for, for TSE, um, which is better than control risk, which a, a lot of the rest of the UK has. But we've got to a, a stage now with BSE where um, it's almost like a meteor. We have all the controls in place, in place in, so in, in, you know, for some time now. And as happened in Scotland, there's always the chance of just one coming out of nowhere. And uh, it would depend what sort of BSE it, it, it was. Um, but I can imagine that um, all things would be dropped and uh, I'd be running very fast uh, to ensure that we could um, reassure our customers because that's what this is about. This is no longer a public health concern in the immediate term. It's about reassuring markets. Any issues, anything? Uh, well, just to inform the committee, the last case of BSE was found in 2012. You know, and again, as Robert says, we have achieved negligible risk, which is the best status that we can have for BSE. Yeah. But it's to you, Chair, it's reassuring to know that the department are fully prepared. I would even like talking about it, Morris. <laughs> okay, William, are you okay, Morrison? Yes, thank you, Chair. William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, no, mine's just a simple thing. Uh, I just see here uh, 2019-082 in relation to some more minor changes in relation to animal identification. What would that be? That, that you're referring there to, to one of our updating SORs. Um, so the changes that were made by that particular SOR were they were purely technical, as, as Robert has said. So um, basically, where um, EU law references to EU laws in our domestic legislation needed to be updated because the EU laws themselves had either been amended um, or repealed. So, um, and that wasn't reflected in our domestic legislation. So that instrument brought the legislation up to date. Okay. Thank you. Very much a tidying up exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, 2018, 204, the Sioux Technical Standards, just a wee one on that. Have any existing breed societies been unable to meet the new conditions? So we've actually, um, because we only have uh, the three livestock breed societies, they've all went through the, the processes and all three have been uh, successful and all three have uh, retained their status, their good. approved status. Good, that's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you very much. I'm going to go back again to the, I'm going to try and say it. What is it? The transmissible, transmissible spruggiform <laughs> encephalopathies. <laughs> Um, I just, I'm looking at, again, at the consultation response. Can you, I'm new to this, so what is a young lamb, young vet stamp? Right, the, a young lamb is a lamb which is uh, under a year old, yeah. practically, yes. So what's the stamp? Is that like an approval thing? Is that, that, a... that confirms that this is a young lamb and not an old lamb or a yo. Okay, so the British Veterinary Association, they, um, brought up concerns about allowing the food business operators to apply that. That is correct. And then, maybe I'm getting a bit confused, so that was proposed as an optional and not a mandatory requirement. Um, so where was the, 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 was there confusion in the consultation then with the, the vet? So there's going to be an, offic an official vet that will continue to apply that stamp? I think the, the big issue is that it reduces the controls on the stamp, but you can be assured that within a meat plant there will be an official veterinarian present at all okay, times right. and the use of the stamp will be under the control of the official veterinarian. Before the young lamb stamp can be used, again there has to be an agreement between the abattoir and the official veterinarian in the plant. Okay. And has that just been the process the whole way along? Initially, the, the, the OV was responsible for the stamp. Now he's responsible for the use of the stamp, if you can get the, the, the difference between no, the two things. No, that's what I'm trying to get. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the use of and the control of? Practically, the OV had the stamp in his possession at all yeah, times. Okay. Uh, and the new proposal is that the, the meat plant operator would have the stamp 
but he could only use it under the supervision of the official veterinarian. Okay, and the British Veterinary Association have raised concerns with that that they're not. That is correct. That is correct. But we are we consider that the proposals that we have in place yeah. provide us with sufficient control, and we are content with the controls that the legislation gives us. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, Claire, yeah. thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Okay, um, so at this point, all the members indicated to have spoken, and um, I want to thank the officials for their attendance here. Um, I'm going to put the question. Um, the Committee for Agriculture and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019 82, the Animal Health and Welfare Amendment Regulations 2019, and subject to examiner such rules, there's no objection to the rule. The Committee for Agriculture and Environment and Rural Affairs considered the Animal uh, S Concerned SR 2019 197, the Animal Health and Welfare Amendment Number 2 Regulations NI 2019, and subject to examiner statute rules, there's no uh, examiner statute rules report, there's no objection to the rule. Mm -hmm. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs has considered SR 28204, the Zoo Technical Standards Regulations NI 2018, and subject to examiner statute rules, there's no objection to the rule. Mm -hmm. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2018-213, the trans Transmissible Spongiform Encephalopathies Regulations NA 2018, and subject to examiner statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. The members that the Committee of the Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered 20, SR 2019-227, the Officials Controls Animals, Feeds and Food Regulations NA 2019, and subject to examiner statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. Okay. Yeah, at this point, I want to. Uh, oh, sorry, um, yeah. user, 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 free to go. Just before I leave, I want to apologise on behalf of my colleague Fiona McCandless, who can't be with you today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm handing you over to John Joe uh, of Oil to lead for the next. Week. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Uh, okay. Um, okay. The last group of SRs that we're looking at today is from the Rural Affairs, Forest Service, and Estate. Transformation, and the briefing paper is on pages two seven three to two uh, nine six of your pack, and the issues relating to the SRs in this group can be found at pages ten to twenty sixteen of the uh, tabled papers. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, I want to advise members that we're going to consider the two commencement orders first. That's the SR2 2017-78 Rural Needs uh, Act, the SR28-115 Rural Needs Act. Uh, these uh, commencement orders have no procedures th and that they do not need the approval of the committee. They're there for information only. only. So if you want to take a, a moment or two just to take a look at those there and then um, we will then take the opportunity we asked uh, questions. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks. Um, uh, Paul Donnelly, Grade 5, Director of Rural Affairs, and Neil Heaney, Grade 7, Sustainable Rural Communities Branches, are very welcome here uh, before the committee. Uh, this this morning, um, and I appreciate it's for information purposes only, but when, when you're here, you may as well ask a couple of questions, anyhow. Um, see, uh, uh, in relation to the um, Rural Needs Act, um, what's the progress on it, and what success has it been in drilling this down amongst all of the other departments, and indeed the various uh, agencies listed on the face of the bill? Um. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to be here uh, in front of the committee this morning to, to consider and talk about the Rural Needs Act. And, and indeed, we can give you a, a quick update on, on progress as it came in. So, um, the Act came into force for uh, government departments and councils, as you'll know, on the 1st of June 2017. Um, we published the first um, monitoring report in December 2018 that was published on our website. Um, which give, give a good update across the, the government departments and councils uh, in relation to how it's been enacted. Chair, uh, as you appreciate, this has, uh, will take a bit of time. Um, we just published the second report, which was included uh, government departments, councils and public authorities in December 2019. And again, I think you'll, you'll notice step change and, and improvement. Uh, between the first year and the second year in relation to implementation on the ground. So I believe that um, uh, it's progressing well. I suppose you'll understand that over the last number of years, the fact that there hasn't been a sitting assembly, there hasn't been a huge volume of, of new policies and procedures <coughs> developed, which would have an impact on the Act. So I hope now that it'll, it'll, it'll really gain some, some, some progress and, and a bit of momentum over the next couple of years with the sitting assembly in relation to how departments, uh, agencies and councils will consider um, uh, when they're developing new policies or strategies or implementing new actions will and have due regard for rural needs. So I think it's been very positive. It's been a, a, a slowish start, but improving. But I think that will, 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 over the next couple of years, will really take effect and, make, uh, and have an impact. And when, um, if I recall correctly, Paul, whenever the uh, the Act was created, the one, one of the, um, I suppose, the updates that we received would have been... Um, a statement from the minister at various intervals. When would that be expected, or, or is that their monitoring report that you just referred to there? Yeah, well, the monitoring report has has that was published in just December uh, 2019. But um, we can, the minister can take have, has three months to make a statement, and we'll be doing that uh, within the next three months or within the next couple of months. Uh, so there will be a ministerial statement in relation to updating members of progress in the Rural Needs Act within the next few months. Would yes. that be correct? That's yeah. great. Thank you, Paul. Okay, um, well, as there are no other members who have any questions asked this juncture, I want to thank you for making your way up here um, this morning, and uh, thank you very much for that update. Very helpful. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay um, we'll now move on to the remaining SRs in this group. Um, the officials will give a strategic overview, and then we'll cover the SRs as follow. There's six SRs relating to Plant Health uh, Order, Plant Health Order 2018, uh, SR 2018184, SR 2019049, SR 2973, SR 2919151, SR 2919160, SR 2919230. Um, and uh, okay. And so there's two SRs related to Plant Health Wooden Bark Order. SR 2019-99, SR 2019-162, and then there's the six remaining SRs. So, So, I'd like to welcome John Joe O'Boyle, uh, Grade 5 Chief Executive Forest Service, uh, Jim Crummy, Grade 6 Director of Plant Health, Diane Stevenson, Grade 7, Plant Health Policy Branch. And um, I'd like to invite uh, John Joe to provide uh, an overview. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thanks to the committee for the opportunity to uh, present and have the 15 statutory rules scrutinised. I think 14 today and uh, one which I think is scheduled for Thursday. Uh, yeah. I'm a Chief Executive of Forest Service. My responsibilities look after uh, forestry and plant health. So I have got uh, Jim Crummy, who's Head of Plant Health, uh, and Diane Stephen, Head of Policy and Legislation on the plant health side, here to, in support today. Uh, <clears throat> most of the legislation, uh, the SRs that have been made, were made for uh, one of four reasons, really. Uh, the first one being uh, mandatory requirements to make legislation in compliance with the with the EU law. Uh, the second sort of category uh, under which uh, SRs have been made was to consolidate national legislation, uh, which also, uh, in effect, facilitated preparation for EU exit. The third category, uh, in broad terms, was about introducing national measures uh, to increase 
uh, plant health protection for specific uh, items that, that occurred in, in the in the time frame. And uh, the fourth, and probably one of the bigger uh, pieces, uh, was the implementation of new plant health regulations and official control regulations that uh, uh, have, have been in place now since the 14th of, of uh, December. So, uh, <clears throat> so what we're here to deal with today is is that legislation that was laid by the by the Forest Service uh, in compliance with uh, the the evolving EU legal obligations as the, uh, of the UK as a member state. Uh, just a, a little bit of uh, of, of, of outline he, uh, here just before we proceed. Uh, the primary driver for the policy and associated legislation relating to the specific control measures for plant health was uh, up until the 14th of December, the EU Plant Health Directive uh, 2000 Bar 29 EC. This directive, as I've just quickly outlined, was replaced by uh, a, new, a different regulation, EU 16 uh, Bar 29. 2031 of the European Parliament and Council concerning protective measures uh, and the official control regulations EU 17625, uh, which were also introduced uh, by the EU in 17 within uh, what's known as the Smarter Rules for Safer Food Measures. And as I said, these came into effect uh, in the UK on the 14th of December 19. So, in effect, the majority of the legislation and the SRs that we are scrutinising uh, today were made under the former EU legislation, with only the last one, the last SR, uh, uh, being made uh, under the SR, the, the Smarter Rules for Safer Food Regime, on the 14th of, of December. Uh, we talk a little bit uh, more, more uh, just in terms of the individual pieces of legislation, uh, but it may be just helpful just to say what we what, what we do, what, what we try to do in, in the plant health side, what we manage uh, for the committee uh, members. There are many pests and diseases uh, that can seriously damage crops and plants in Northern Ireland, uh, and Forest Service maintain the Northern Ireland, a Northern Ireland Plant Health Risk Register, and that's based obviously on uh, horizon scanning and uh, science and evidence uh, in terms of where the risks are, etc. Uh, so that identifies where main risks, where big, the biggest risks are, uh, and to protect against these risks, uh, we implement policy and enforce controls and restrictions on the importation and the movement of certain high-risk plants and pests associated with plants and controls relating to other materials such as soil. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, again, the international standards for phytosanitary measures uh, are the measures on which all of the EU le legislation is actually based, uh, and <coughs> which protects our economies, our environment, and the risk of spreading and establishing pathogens that aren't already present, uh, for example, in, in Northern Ireland. Worth bearing in mind that uh, Northern Ireland has a recognised plant health status. It's verified uh, as having uh, protected its own status for 23 of the harmful organisms which have been established in the EU but are not present here in Northern Ireland. So, uh, in effect, uh, what we do in terms of the legislation and the controls is to seek to protect that uh, higher plant health status that we have here uh, in, in comparison to other parts, for example, of, of, of Europe. Uh, so, coming back to the specific pieces of legislation <coughs> which were made uh, during the period when uh, the uh, Assembly wasn't sitting, uh, there are 15 <coughs> statutory rules, and I said earlier that one of those is scheduled, as, as I understand, to be debated on or uh, scrutinised on Thursday. Uh, in the first category, I mentioned four categories that made up the, sorry, that the legislation could be grouped into. Uh, Eleven of the SRs, ten which are here today, uh, were made and amended in the category of mandatory legislation in compliance with the EU legislation. These SRs were made under Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act 1972 and related schedules uh, and were subject to negative uh, resolution. What they done, they incorporated into Northern Ireland legislation the required measures within the transposition deadlines and the statutory rules 
uh, that are in this group uh, were needed to ensure that the relevant EU laws could operate effectively in Northern Ireland and uh, to, make what we, <coughs> to make sure that we avoided the threat of infraction proceedings uh, by the European Commission and any associated financial penalties, which of course could continue to prevail even uh, beyond the uh, EU exit date. Uh, if we had not made the legislation, we would have been lagging behind other jurisdictions of the UK and, uh, that have made similar instruments <coughs> to implement the relevant EU laws. <coughs> And that would have left us, obviously, with no powers, uh, no legal powers, no legal basis to carry out the enforcement actions to protect our plant health status uh, and our trading ability. So these 11 SRs uh, weren't subject to consultation as the implementation of this EU legislation was actually mandatory. Uh, however, uh, there was uh, certain occasions when the impact of the proposed legislation was discussed in a targeted way with stakeholders uh, as appropriate. and. Uh, the SRs that are in that in, in this category, uh, I just I just maybe uh, run them through so as you can follow them through on your on your papers. Uh, there's 17, sorry, 201786, 201719, 201818183, 201949, 201950, 201973. 20199, 20199, 20160, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, 20916, now made under the new uh, smarter routes for safer food regime, and we come, come back to that just perhaps in a minute. Uh, so uh, the ones that are actually uh, revoked are 49, 2019, that is, sorry, that is 21949, 21999, 219160, and 21162. <coughs> so that's that outlines sort of. I hope there's quite a lot in there, but I hope that outlines uh, the, the the position regarding uh, those uh, those set of regulations in terms of uh, the reasons for making them, etc. The next category I mentioned uh, was uh, consolidation. Uh, we, have, we have two SRs: the Plant Health Order. 2018 on the Plant Health and Seeds Miscellaneous Amendments Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and they were made to consolidate national legislation and alignment with DEFRA and the other DAs. Uh, this consolidation was scheduled uh, to facilitate preparations for the EU exit, uh, and in making those uh, these SRs, there was four further commissioning and implementing directives that were incorporated incorporated into the Plant Health Order Northern Ireland 2018, and that was consistent with uh, the rest of the UK's position on that. That was a consolidation issue, making, making, making of these two SRs. Uh, the third category that I mentioned uh, is um, two SRs that were uh, laid in order to introduce national measures for the protection against specific uh, pests that occurred during the period. One was the oak processionary moth, and the other was uh, changes to the wooden bark amendment order uh, 2019, and that was to introduce controls on the importation of ash. People will probably uh, remember the, the issue of the infected ash trees. So those two SRs were made in order to uh, uh, enhance the protection uh, against those 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 particular pests. I don't think so. Uh, and as we, what do you mean? I mentioned at the start of my uh, my my uh, presentation about the smarter rules for safer food regime uh, coming into uh, operation in the UK in the 14th of uh, December. So these. 
the, the, e, the EU regulations were implemented in Northern Ireland Assembly with the laying of the plant health official controls and miscellaneous provisions regulations, uh, Northern Ireland, which is SR uh, 19 230. <clears throat> so this SR established a regulatory framework for the protective measures against pests of plants, uh, also a strong focus on the prevention and it addressed weaknesses in the previous legislation by strengthening the plant health controls. Uh, plant health con official controls miscellaneous provisions regulations uh, 19 SR implements the EU regulations onto the smarter rules for safer food package and this was required as I say from the from the 14th of December uh, this was actually the most significant change in EU plant health legislation for some 30 years uh, implementing uh, the, in effect the, the brand new uh, uh, plant health regulations and official control regulations. This SR, 2019 SR, revokes and remakes six of the SRs uh, already mentioned to consolidate these into <coughs> this new single SR uh, to simplify the plant health regulations going forward. The six SRs referred to uh, that are now uh, consolidated uh, are 18, 2018, 184, 2019, 49, 2019, 99, 2019, 151, 2019, 160, and uh, 2019, 162. So, uh, as I've said, that is uh, the most significant uh, uh, piece of, 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 of change to the legislative framework uh, that resides around the, uh, the plant health controls, uh, legislative and controls. <coughs> the EU regulation contains a number of commission em empowerments for delegated and implementing acts that provide the legal means to adjust controls for up to six years from them coming into force. Consequently, further SRs will be required uh, or will be, will be uh, to make adjustments to take account of uh, the Commission decisions still to be still to, to come to the fore. Uh, so on on that, on that basis, uh, the 2019 piece of legislation, uh, and health uh, piece of legislation, we are uh, likely to be back to the committee in the not too distant future to seek to make further adjustments to the 19 piece of legislation uh, in order to take account of. Uh, new decisions uh, from the from the EU. So I hope uh, this gives you a sort of a, a structured overview of uh, the, le the suite of legislation that was been passed or put forward by the Forest Service and laid uh, in, in, in the period. Uh, and we're happy to provide any further clarity uh, to what I've already said, uh, myself or my colleagues, and respond to any of your questions. Thank you uh, for that very comprehensive. Uh a briefing, uh, John Joe. Um, I'm going to move to questions, but b before I do, um, the fact that there's been a number of those SRs have been revoked, uh, the clerk is going to have to seek guidance as to whether we can actually put the question to the committee today. Okay. So we, we may have to defer that till Thursday's yes. meeting. Uh, but, okay. but still, question officials, uh, now when we have the opportunity, in front, of, in front of us here today. Okay. So the first uh, on the list is John John Dallas for a question. Uh, Chair Anderson, uh, thanks. And, and uh, with, with uh, your approval, could I say uh, how delighted I am with the Forestry Service and how they have enabled the wider community to integrate with that wonderful asset. So, uh, John Joe, you'll appreciate that any concern about any disease to any tree or plant uh, is serious, and I'm talking about oak, processionary moth, OPM. Uh, it would be interesting to know where this was discovered. Was it discovered in Britain or was it in Northern Ireland? And I would have to declare a particular interest in that, and you may already know the answer. One of the finest collections of oak trees anywhere in Ireland is in one of your forests outside Kilray uh, called uh, Movanagher, uh, where people, and obviously uh, uh, Diana knows about this, uh, people come not just from all over Ireland to see 
Mm. Now, I'm not into hugging those trees, but I do go to see them occasionally. And they're simply amazing, planted in 1932. Uh, so, uh, Chairperson, are you satisfied that there is sufficient uh, law in place to ensure that the like of that crop would not, not be wiped out uh, by OPM or some other deadly disease? Well, thank you for your comments uh, regarding the use of the forest asset. Amazing. Uh, uh, it's something we've been working on uh, for some years and it's yes. really, really taking uh, a lot of feet now and uh, a, lot of, a lot of very positive uh, uh, response to that from our customers, from our visitors to the forest. Uh, moving on to the old processionary moth issue, uh, that was uh, discovered initially, or discovered in Kent, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. back in, in uh, back in 2000, early in 2019, uh, and uh, with a lot of these uh, kind of findings, uh, sorry, I should say we haven't we haven't any presence of it in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, that's uh, so it was discovered in Kent, and like a lot of these. Uh, Findings, uh, they get dealt with as an in as as an incident, and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, a control zone based around them, and eradication of the of the disease on site, etc., etc., and prevention of movement, etc., around that. As far as the legislation that we introduced here, largely that was to do the very thing that you're asking about. Uh, is there enough uh, control around such a thing like that? So we responded to that, and we introduced legislation uh, that. Uh, Restricted the movement of ash trees uh, of a certain size because uh, trees of a certain size uh, have the capacity to, I suppose, host the organism and, and transport it. But trees of a different size, a smaller size, don't have the capacity to to, to host the organism. So any trees uh, that were larger than uh, prescribed size were restricted from entering into into Northern Ireland. Really, so that that's largely what the leg the legislation was doing here. The uh, the the OPM. Uh, so, I think uh, I think to answer your question, then, are we satisfied that yeah. there is enough legislation in place? I think the the direct answer to that is that we always need to be vigilant. We always need to be. Uh, Totally in tune with uh, what is going on. What what are the new risks? What are the new threats uh, coming along? And we have to be responsive in terms of perhaps introducing further national measures on an each must basis. And I think that's the, the answer to your question. Sir okay. President, at the risk of being t ruled totally out of order, could mm -hmm. I ask at some time in the future the committee does in fact learn of some of the astonishing work that is going on in our forests? And I'm thinking in particular of Garver Forest. Where Christmas was never like it before. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you, we'd be, and uh, we'd be happy to extend an invitation, if need be, uh, to uh, uh, if that's appropriate, uh, f to the committee to, to visit a forest. Uh, if That'd that be suits. brilliant. Yeah. We'll note that, and yeah, uh, whenever the, that the member and we may extend to Philip as well. Me to declare that this has been from the Oak County. <laughs> Very good. Are <laughs> you declaring interest in this topic? Um, did I have uh, Claire Billy up? Thank you, Thanks. Chair, and thank you very much. I um, just have a few questions on a few different issues. So I know you've raised concerns there about um, the revoke. So if I overstep question or whatever, just call me out. But sticking with the forestry one, so it's right that it's in terms of deciding when an EIA is needed, it's the department that makes that decision. It's not a standard requirement. Am I right? Yeah, there's a, there's a, a screening process. So, yeah, it goes through a screening process, and then the, screening, uh, the outcome of the screening will determine whether it requires a full uh, 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 assessment yeah. or not. Yeah. OK. Um, and is that the same across the UK? Or is that just here? No, no it's, uh, it's very similar uh, across the UK. There's slight differences mm. in just in terms of uh, thresholds and other things like that, uh, mainly thresholds. Okay. But, uh, the, the principles are, are very similar. So yeah. it would be the department again that would yeah, make right. that, that call. Yeah. Um, you state also that the consultation on this was closed in April 17, um, but there's no details of consultation responses. Could you maybe give us a, an update um, and let us know how that went or if there were any concerns? raised at the time, or have there been any identified since the implementation? No, no, 
I think uh, I think what happened there uh, what, what what happened there was that the consultation was uh, kicked off uh, by uh, in a period when they, we had the assembly and the and the Northern Ireland executive uh, up and running. So that was uh, out to consultation in order to have a, a wider look at the. Uh, at the EIA uh, regulations, uh, in the time, uh, then uh, very shortly afterwards, uh, what happened then was uh, we we uh, we didn't we, we didn't have a, uh, an, an assembly in order to scrutinise uh, fully a, a piece of new legislation, let's say, or a, a, a fairly significantly amended one. So what what happened then at that point was that the uh, the new legislation was laid then simply stepping right back to only introduce those mandatory things that we needed to make the changes to. Okay. So so that that's where it now sits, if that answers your answers your question. Yeah. And just the, the, the minimal changes that you have done, is there feedback or comment well, on any We of have those? some feedback. We certainly have feedback on on uh, on the consultation that, that, that we have but uh, and, and that as I say is around thresholds and other things like that. So because because that is something <coughs> we would like to uh, Take forward through the through the process of of, of committee scrutiny and the uh, minister, uh, uh, okay. etc. Uh, we we step back, as I say, to introduce only the minimum that we needed to do in order to comply with the EU legislation. Thank you. And then, uh, moving on to the SR 2017-119 marketing fruit plant propagation, you give um, in your briefing on that one that um, you had intended to approach any producers. Um, has this been done? Uh, that particular, a very, very small number, uh, in fact there are no commercial propagators of, okay. of, 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 of fruit material. Effectively there we're looking at a species like melis, uh, apples and uh, top fruit or fruits like uh, blackberry and loganberries. So we don't have any commercial I produce production. them in my garden. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you produce uh, plants for planting and selling on? <laughs> in which case I'll have to get somebody. To visit you. <laughs> Very good. Um, so that SR was laid in June and hasn't affected anybody really in Northern Ireland. Then? I don't think there's okay. been no um, been no material impact on any right. businesses locally. Okay. And then moving on to the plant health of 2019 151. Yep. Um, with me. So. Um, the, this is the one with the targeted stakeholder consultation, um, and then you state that that was a ring around of eight organisations. Is it only eight organisations you would class as being stakeholders with this one? Uh, the consultation was targeted at those who were importing for planting oak trees. So it was basically about the legislation which was going to put additional restrictions on what oak trees could be imported and we directed the consultation to the number of um, importers and the number of um, stakeholders that we knew would be involved in this. Okay. And that was the emergency measures? Uh, that was the emergency, emergency, measures? Of emergency okay. measures, yes. Okay. Um, and there has, has there been any identified risk in, in Northern Ireland with that? We are monitoring, yeah. uh, and we've got a strict monitoring regime associated with the legislation, monitoring and surveillance. Uh, we have publicised widely and we have actually involved other departments because this has public health mm. impact as well. So we have um, ensured that those who, whom this would impact on have been informed. And there's significant details on the website as well. Okay. okay. Well, is, it just, is there any is it a similar situation in the, the Republic, in the South? We have co aligned that we have discussed with our colleagues in Daffam. We've, as we have discussed with our colleagues in De DEFRA and, uh, the De and Scotland and Wales, uh, yes, uh, similar legislation uh, has been introduced and we do make every effort to co-align to ensure that that is, uh, that is the case. Particularly across the island. Just Absolutely. The, Nor the island of Ireland, and you will hear this from us again, is one epidemiological unit <laughs> and we treat it as that. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Right, Claire. Thanks. Okay, uh, William, you're looking to get in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in relation to process review, um, uh, in relation to 2019-151, uh, what's the current position in Northern Ireland with oak tree for that process review? Is it easy in oak? What's the current position in Northern Ireland? We don't, 
We, we, we don't have uh, oh, we don't have the disease here, and that uh, since we've been, we've been just been told to, to do everything we can to make sure that we don't get it here. But as uh, Diana is saying, we need to be vigilant. We need to be we need to be monitored, and we need to uh, make sure that we stay fully abreast with uh, the eradication of the of the. Uh, the pest and pathogen in, in Kent as well, and we need to uh, liaise well with that, with with uh, Daphne, with Depra uh, as well, to make sure that we are fully aligned with, and we feed into uh, we feed into a uh, a, a UK group uh, in order to monitor this the spread or the risk of spread and any change to that risk, so we know uh, wh where we stand stand with that. In relation to the what about the Republic of Ireland? Are they free too? Yes, that's good. Yeah. Yes, yeah. thank you, William um, Rosemary. Yeah, just one follow-on, and it's just a clarification in relation to William. You mentioned the Republic of Ireland. If there was an outbreak of of this uh, moth, oh, per processionary moth, are the Republic of Ireland uh, rules and regulations similar ex similar to our own? They would, they would so that they can put something in post in immediately there in yeah, place. They, uh, what what happens in a situation like that is that uh, let's say they had a finding, uh, then they would take the same approach as uh, as as in Kent. They would they would do a, yeah. uh, uh, a curtain around, they would have a, 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 a ten kilometre zone, uh, and they would monitor within that. They would eradicate the, the disease and they would control the movement of. Uh, of uh, material uh, from within that uh, uh, to, to, to prevent spread from, from that from that area and continue to monitor that until they were satisfied that uh, that was completely eradicated before so so they, they would they would obviously take that action uh, not only to stop it spreading for example to to the north here but also to stop it from spreading even within their own jurisdiction so they, so that so we would, yeah, they would take the same the same approach to that as uh, as would we if we found it, or indeed the same that has already been taken in in, in the Kent outbreak. Yeah. So there would be cooperation. Absolutely. Obviously, I live in Fermanagh South Tyrone, of and <laughs> of course I'm in, being on the border, representing the border yeah. area. Mm -hmm. There would be cooperation together between the two, absolutely. two yeah, absolutely. departments. Yeah. yeah. Okay. True. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. You. But just, just to add, I mean, the, the, the authorities in the south are, are fully abreast of uh, the controls that are happening in Kent. Uh, so they're, they're, in the same way as we are, uh, uh, engaged in, in, in the management of that outbreak in Kent, then so are they uh, observing that as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. and Can I just add to that yes. by saying that yeah. in recent times we have undertaken a joint exercise with our colleagues in Daphne which rehearsed the situation for an outbreak, and we're fully up to date with details of contact points and and mapping arrangements, and we, we have actually had to do that to fulfil an EU requirement. So these transboundary exercises have been undertaken. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, and uh, very assured. I'm sorry, Rosemary. Right. I, I just want to move on to um, to two zero nineteen ninety nine. And it's just the import of the solid, the solid fuel wood. Is that related in any way to the recent popularity with these wood, wood burning stoves? And does the importation of wood represent a risk regarding bringing in pests and disease, diseases? I, I think I'll ask Jim to, uh, to deal with that question. Yeah, I think. You know, it's a, it's a it's an issue that uh, we mentioned earlier about horizon scanning, yeah. and uh, as part of the risk assessments that we undertake with colleagues across this island and across the UK Plant Health Service, uh, we would do a lot of horizon scanning for new threats. Now, there are threats and recognised threats in firewood, and in fact in uh, wood packaging material. So, as part of our in-year surveillance programme, we would conduct targeted, uh, focused inspections. Uh, at the ports, at imports, because it's better to prevent the importation. So we look at uh, at groundwood to make sure that it doesn't have any bark, because a lot of the a lot of the protected zones that we have for against bark beetles that occur in other parts of Europe, which don't occur here, uh, quite often are contained in bark. So we have a legal requirement to remove all bark from conifer wood, um, firewood. Uh, there, we probably had identified that there were some trade in. Uh, in, in wood, uh, 
so we have we had restrictions in place to make sure there was no ash imported because of a, albeit a small risk of further introducing a uh, clear ash dieback. Uh, but additionally, there's uh, you've got to be careful against international trade, uh, trade in, in maybe movement from outside the EU into the EU. So that's why we'd be, uh, we be we we sort of monitor a lot of wood packaged material, which quite often is not associated with um, plant or plant products. But it could be associated with, for example, uh, marble from uh, the Far East, which is used in ceremonial headstones. Yeah. Uh, that can contain a lot of uh, quite difficult, uh, I won't go into detail of them, but they're a thing called a longhorn beetle. And there are a series of uh, beetles which could be very, very damaging if introduced. So I suppose the whole point of what we're trying to do is prevent the introduction and spread. That's why we introduced the controls on materials such as firewood. Uh, and for example, the likes of OPM are restricted. Uh, we don't allow imports of oak below, uh, they have to be below a certain size, and effectively, it's, we only permit whips. And again, it's cross border. I take it this uh, cross border cooperation wood coming from the Republic up to Northern Ireland? Uh, wood would, would be limited restrictions on intra EU movement. Uh, there are restrictions on conifer wood. Uh, even from GB to NI, we have restrictions. Uh, there's only one area of southwest Scotland where we would permit conifer wood to be imported from. Um, outside that area, we don't we don't allow it unless it is debarked and kiln dried. So uh, there are quite restrictions, quite quite a lot of restrictions. Outside um, third countries outside Europe, uh, we're very very would be very limited. Uh, importations of, uh, in fact, all plants and plants <coughs> planting from outside the EU have to have, uh, to have to be inspected before they arrive here. They have to be pre-notified. So there are quite a lot of controls, official controls in place. Thank you. In very general terms, the uh, you know the, the, the risks of the transportation and the importation of path pests and pathogens uh, are <coughs> mostly to be associated with. Uh, trees or plants that have got bark on them and uh, and uh, wood that has been, uh, for argument's sake, treated in some way, uh, perhaps heat treated or processed and heat treated or whatever, then don't carry that, that kind of risk. So it, 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 it tends to be, I suppose, more raw material or plants for planting uh, that still have got the bark, uh, etc., that are uh, most likely to be carrying uh, uh, pa pests and pathogens. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Morris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's uh, SR 2018184. Uh, and it's to do with Citrus Black Spot. I wasn't aware that we had an industry that produced citrus food. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I don't have fact, them in my garden. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. You're, you're, you're right, we don't have an indigenous citrus industry. Yeah. Um, but again, as part of the of the, the EU, you know, there are certain requirements that are mandatory across the EU. Um, now there are obviously citrus is an important commercial crop in southern Europe, uh, Italy, southern Spain. We import a lot of produce, but we don't propagate. We, and I think as John Joe referred there, we don't have we don't plant out plants for planting to harvest citrus. Uh, but it's prudent as public because it's part of the European-wide approach to prevent the introduction of, of citrus black spot. The, the, the legislation applies to the whole of the of the EU. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought we'd had the, the climate for citrus. But, <laughs> but Chairman, I, just to pick up on a point that John made there, uh, I would be a small-scale tree hugger. I haven't hugged a tree, okay. but many a time I've sat with a flask of tea and a soggy sandwich at the base of one. And I've been a regular visitor to uh, Downhill, Castle Row, Mount Sandal, and I'm now going to put in Vanacker as a destination. Is there any plans from the department to you, Chair, to uh, introduce more forests, especially deciduous trees and forests across Northern Ireland? I think Northern Ireland is pretty bereft of trees. Mm -hmm. from, uh, most skilled tree hugger like me, it's not nice. Yeah. Uh, the answer to your question is yes, uh, there are plans to do that, uh, and you're quite correct. The, the 
I suppose, percentage cover of Northern Ireland that is under trees uh, is lower than the rest of uh, GB, uh, or the rest of the UK, uh, NG and GB particularly, lower than the South as well, and uh, quite a lot lower than typically in Europe. Uh, uh, we have got about 8% uh, of tree cover in Northern Ireland just now, and the average for the UK would be about 12%. Uh, we do have a forestry strategy. Uh, current forestry strategy that was actually written back in uh, 2006 and a key part of that strategy was that we needed um, to modernise our legislation, our forestry act and other things which we've done and we took it through uh, uh, former committees and, 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 and the assembly uh, in terms of the forestry act 2010. So part of that is all about promoting uh, sustainable forestry and promoting it in a way that's good for society and good for the environment and, and, and all of that. Uh, so that forestry strategy did envisage, uh, to cut to the chase, uh, it did envisage uh, making all efforts we could to get the forest cover in Northern Ireland up from uh, up to the, at least the same as we were uh, as we had in the rest of uh, the UK, uh, up to twelve percent. Now that means uh, that means. Uh, Back from 2006, it means almost doubling the forest cover that was there from 2006 up to, to get to 12. So you're doubling up from 6% to 12%, which is uh, which is quite a quite a quite a severe challenge. Uh, the, the the mechanism that we that we're using to do that has been to grant aid uh, uh, landowners uh, who wish to grant land. We we purchase some land where it's of strategic importance to ourselves, but. It tends, it tends to be that we haven't been purchasing much land to add to the public forest estate uh, over recent uh, years, uh, and uh, mostly the mostly the strategy envisages supporting the people who already own the land to uh, to put trees on that land. You asked the question specifically about um, um, broadleaf trees and, yep. and, and and that. So our grant schemes uh, do uh, encourage broadleaf trees, but of course. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, and the types of land that comes available, not all of the land is actually suitable for broadleaf trees. So where broadleaf trees are, uh, suppose, let's say, the right choice for a site or whatever, then the grant schemes will, will promote that. Uh, but where uh, um, coniferous type trees are the probably the only type of tree that's going to grow on more, more acid soils and things like that, then we still grant aid uh, coniferous trees uh, on that. So, uh, and I know that uh, our, our minister is very keen uh, uh, in, in, in early discussions, is very keen to see that uh, the, uh, that every effort is made to increase the, the, the forest cover here uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks for your patience, sir. Okay. Um, I suppose um, before we move on, um, I just want to be associated with the comments were made in relation to some of the developments around your uh, forest throughout the north and certainly um, my own part of the world, the, the Gorchant Lands uh, project in conjunction with the council has been absolutely superb and there's many other examples throughout the north and I'm also aware of ambitious plans by the in the Kappa uh, Village Renewal Area uh, group who are looking at the potential of Altmore Forest which straddles the Middle Council and the Fermanagh Council, Council yeah. uh, in terms of community benefit and recreation opportunities. So just on the back of that there, would it be possible to maybe uh, ask yourselves to provide us perhaps with a, a written feedback uh, update on the work that you have been carrying out with the councils and community groups and indeed any plans that you have uh, for the future? We can provide you with, uh, with a, a summary of what we've been doing over recent years and uh, on what's in the cards and what, what we plan to go forward with. Perfect, that would be, that would be very appreciated. Sure. Um, so I thank the officials for your attendance, um, but I'm going to also ask here now that, that we defer putting the question on these ASRs until Thursday, um, because a number of them, as, as I said previously, have been revoked, and Stella is going to seek some advice on that there before we actually put the question, but we can do it um, virtually first thing. At our very early at the meeting on Thursday, that okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Members agreed? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, okay, I want you to refer to you as to page 699 to 707 correspondence. Um, this correspondence reports and consultations 
have been received in the committee since March 2017. Anything that requires the committee responsible to consider the future meeting, should a member require any further information or wish to see any of the correspondence, please contact the, uh, the committee office staff. In terms of the forward work programme, um, members note that the Minister and Permanent Secretary will be at the committee this Thursday, 30th of January, to give a first day briefing to the committee. And after that briefing, the committee will consider four outstanding SRs. Plus the ones from today. Plus the, we put the question in relation to the ones from today. Mm -hmm. And I want to refer to you to the memo in your packs at page 709 to 710. Uh, memo and so do you want to brief the committee on that? Memo? Yeah, okay. Well, members, you've already been informed that the Minister and Perm Sec will be coming to the committee first thing on Thursday morning, um, and um, they'll give you an overview of the, the breakdown of the department, its budget, its staffing, its business groups, and the main priorities. Um, and then um, the heads of each business area will be coming to the committee thereafter to give you a more in-depth briefing on their business areas, their priorities. And hopefully between all of that, you'll get an idea of also the, the legislation that's coming down the road to you, both primary, secondary and legislative consent motions coming from uh, the UK Parliament. Um, as well as that, as well as getting that departmental briefing, I also thought it might be useful for you to, to hear from the main stakeholders. And I have listed those on page 710 there. There's a list of the main stakeholders under each group, under or sort of each interest area, food and farming, environment, rural development, waste and fisheries, inland and sea fishing. And um, if members are content, um, we'll try and get those um, briefings scheduled in the coming weeks ahead. Okay. okay. And then also there's other groups there that are listed under paragraph four. Um, that we'll try and schedule as time allows, if you're content with that. Yeah. Okay. And then just wanted to raise the issue, I haven't got it on the briefing there, of uh, potential visits. It's been mentioned a couple of times there. I had a quick conversation with the, the, the chair yesterday about that, and I think it would be good if the committee was seen to be out and about, get something organised between now and Easter. I'm just going to throw out some ideas and see what, you know, you can let me know what you think. Don't have to make up our minds out now. We'll put it back on maybe for um, further and fuller consideration on Thursday. But a number of members have individually mentioned to me about Maboy, the illegal waste site, and you could do Bally Kelly at the same time. Um, a number of members have mentioned to me about um, the ports in Belfast, particularly the role that the ports Belfast and Larne will play uh, in the in the after the transition period is over and their capacity and ability to handle whatever might be coming their way. Um, there's an invitation there from Forestry. Um, the um, other one that the committee may want to be going to visit is actually AFBI and LOX Agency. There's CAFRI visits and there would be visits to uh, recycling. Waste management is actually much bigger than most people realise. So there's recycling as in domestic waste. There's um, anaerobic digesters that um, have sprung up all over the place and there would have been um, land um, landfill as well. So those are the kind of things that we're thinking of. So if you're content, maybe I'll just put down a wee list of those to you for, for Thursday. You can have better give you a chance to consider them more. And you can make your mind about, you know, we'll try and get something organised between now and Easter recess. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. And do you want to raise that? Okay. Um, can we get agreement then, buddy, to... The, for the staff to contact the list of organisations table to provide them uh, to brief the committee. Yeah. Good. What was that, sorry? Um, sure. See the, the list of organisations on the table? Seven uh, tails. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Can we, for Stella, or right for, sir, sir. contact them to write them to brief the, yeah. the committee? Yeah. Um, suggest, this was a suggestion of a stakeholder event for the wider rural community. could be organised as a lunchtime event immediately after the committee meeting to coincide with uh, an, the evidence session. Right. Okay. Stakeholder event with the rural, so you can only probably only get a small number of them around the table at one, but maybe just have a, a stakeholder meeting around table, sort of like speed dating session immediately after the committee meeting with the rest of the rural groups. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on whether I can get a room booked or not here. <laughs>
and we mentioned about the committee visits. Um, you briefed the committee on possible committee visit. Oh, sorry, sorry, a possible committee visit mm -hmm. between now and the Easter recess, where we would actually take the committee out mm -hmm. um, and have the committee meeting out on site somewhere. Well, it'll be more visits, I think. Just visits, yeah, yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Yep. Yeah. Um, members of any other business? Okay. Okay, date and time of next meeting is Thursday, 30th of January 2020, 10 a.m., room, room 30. And we'll have the Minister of the Permanent Secretary yes. with us. That. Mm -hmm. And I want to join the meeting and thank you for your cooperation. Yeah. Thank you, Annette. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.